America has pretty much run out of countries uh, to invade. Uh, are we seeing all this rhetoric about Taiwan because there could be a shift where they're just kind of saying, you know, hey, we've sold all our toys to uh, to the Alinsky government. Um, we need to reload uh, just like car salesmen and boat salesmen. They get on the boats and they head over to the shores of Taiwan and say, hey, we got some new gear for you guys. Anybody want to take that one? Well, I mean, I think it's 100 percent true. You hear it's it, so, you know, you hear it in the U.S. political establishment, people like Michael McCall, they say I mean, there is this House Committee on China, House Committee on the CPC, you know, they call it the CCP. They have these committees. They are talking about this. They go on mainstream media outlets like Meet the Press and they say we should be voting in Congress for a war to defend Taiwan from China. Uh, these are, I think, very real plans. And even before the U.S. political establishment, was saying it outright uh you have had um it, it, and i think we've had kind of more softer versions of this come from the current ruling administration and across the mainstream establishment media from foreign policy magazine to financial times they have spoken to the so-called quote-unquote experts and usually these experts are directly connected to the military industrial complex they're former uh, NATO general secretaries. They are people like in the leaked documents, like Mike Minahan, uh, top brass in the U.S. Air Force. They're James Bierman, top general, U.S. general uh, occupying Japan. You have over and over and over again talks about Taiwan being next and how Ukraine serves as a springboard and a litany of lessons for how that war should be fought. So I do think that these are very legitimate plans. I think they are being planned at right now, at this very moment. And I do think it's because, number one, Russia and China are seen together by the U.S. foreign policy establishment. They are seen as two giants in the East that must be contained, overthrown, destroyed, so that the U.S. can maintain its political, economic, and military supremacy. But then on the other hand, Alex, your point is a good one. The empire, right, if the collective West is dominated by the American empire, the American empire doesn't really have many other places to go, and it has actually been beaten back in places that I don't think the United States expected to be beaten back in. For example, Afghanistan. <laughs> they were ejected from Afghanistan, a country that is by far weaker economically and militarily than anything Russia and China could offer. But whether it's Afghanistan or whether it's Syria, whether it's even in Latin America, where a lot of countries are rejecting U.S. political supremacy, let alone attempting uh, coups and military interventions out of the question almost at this point, it is true that the U.S. foreign policy strategists and these war hawks and war makers are thinking about, well, what is the end game here? It's obvious that number one on the agenda is weakening China, slowing down its progress. And so it really is tunnel vision. It, you know, it's almost it's like chasing the dragon. Addicted to war can't stop. But there's a lot of understanding that it's probably not going to go well as these war simulations from the Center for Strategic International Studies and the Center for New American Security all say, they all say, it won't go well. They'll they'll just patch a victory on it. They'll say the United States wins. But then in the fine text, you see, oh, well, you lose your entire naval fleet. You you end up losing tens of thousands. And guess what? The whole economic <laughs> system worldwide is destroyed. Victory. Right. And, and that's um, that's kind of, I think, the mentality of the foreign policy establishment. It's kind of like this pursuit of dominance at all costs. Let me put a thought in your guys's head for a moment here. OK. And then uh, we'll ask our followers here what they think of this. I'm going to give you three scenarios uh, of where this conflict could go. One, it could shift to Taiwan. So everybody watching, let us know if you think this could definitely shift or migrate over to Taiwan. Two, Sudan. Just putting that out there. Okay. And three, 
how about full on Russian territory itself? Could this extend well past the borders of the you know Donbass and right into central Russia? You know, whether it's a uh, Siberia part, who knows? Could there be attacks on major cities? Because let's think about this for a moment here. The NATO boys have uh, decided to sign up two new countries, okay? Estonia, Sweden, and uh, gearing them up. Uh, is that correct? Estonia, Sweden, and the Finland, uh, Sweden, Finland, right? Finland, Finland, yeah. Oh, sorry, Estonia's Sweden. already in, yeah. <laughs> you guys are right. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I need to be corrected on that. Estonia comes to my mind because I used to visit there uh, quite a bit. But um, yes, um, we have two new countries that uh, are in NATO. My concern is, is maybe they are ready to flex their muscle and show some action here. So I don't know, Brian. I mean, I have a feeling that if they're going to extend this, they'll just go right into the Russian territory. No problem for them. Well, I, What's I think stop them? In, in NATO's wildest dream, they would love to do that. But the problem is uh, that they are reaching the limits of what they can do militarily. They're, right now, they're waging a proxy war against Russia. They're out of artillery shells. They're, they're conserving a lot of their other weapon systems. They don't want to really send them to Ukraine or they're not capable of sending them to U Ukraine. Uh, they're going to have the same problems, though, if they were to, say, bring in tanks. They start running low on, on tank ammunition. Where is additional tank ammunition going to come from? Uh, Russia seems to have had it in their mind that they were going to fight this large scale conflict somewhere, uh, you know, in Eastern Europe, most likely Ukraine. They've been preparing for it for years. The United States has been, along with their allies, fighting these small wars mm. all around the world. When you decide you're going to go to, to war, you have to plan years ahead of time. You have to uh, spin up your industrial base and uh, gear it toward that. And that has that, that could take months or even years to do as we're finding out they want to produce more artillery shells for Ukraine right now. And they're saying, well, maybe in you know two or three years, we might have uh, a third of what, what they need, what they're firing right now, which is, which is still too few to match Russia. So this is their problem. A land war with Russia in Eastern Europe or, or within Russian territory this really is not feasible for the U.S. right now and its allies. They 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 didn't build the military necessary to do this. Uh, they have been building up their military to wage this war with China. A lot of a lot of the equipment that they're holding on to, they refuse to give to Ukraine, like attackums. These are actually missiles they want to use in uh, uh, in the Pacific with China. Uh, if they get involved in a war with Russia in Ukraine or beyond Ukraine's borders in Russia, they, they will need to mo mobilize their air power, NATO air power. All of the munitions those planes are using, that, that is all earmarked for a war with China. They cannot, they cannot do both. You have to pick one or the other. They've exhausted their land forces in Ukraine already by proxy. And now they have to ask themselves, uh, should we do this uh, with, with China? The problem is that the US had this huge plan uh, they planned the uh, decades ahead of time. They wanted to reassert U.S. Uh, hegemony across the entire planet. The Soviet Union collapsed, and they were ready to fill the void. Yet they could not get it done in time. Now they are out of time. The, the window of opportunity is closing. China is rising. Russia has reemerged. It, it's just not possible. So they're, they're out of time, but they're still, they don't know what else to do. So they're still going to go and, and try it anyway, no matter how ill-advised. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it really is uh, something to behold. But my concern is, once again, what, you, you know, you did explain that they uh, are running out of artillery in most of these countries. My concern is, is that we're going to see a mistake here. And that happens. And uh, it could really escalate things. Uh, and then, then at that point... You know, as you said, of course, uh, you have the experience from it, uh, knowing that, uh, you know, it takes years to plan for war. But we did see a buildup in, uh, you know, the two Iraqi wars that, uh, you know, the Americans were involved in. 
I mean, you could, it was almost a day, day by day, play by play. Uh, you could see, you know, CNN was getting in there showing, hey, look at, uh, we're airlifting tanks. Uh, you know, these bombers are leaving these air bases. We might just see that. We just might see a hurry up offense, as it's called, uh, into full on escalation. I can, I can see it. I've seen, I saw it in, in, in Yugoslavia. I mean, it was just unbearable on on how bad they got you know when they got there and then what they did you know the 78 days of of aerial bombardment that they did in yugoslavia there is nothing that is going to stop i mean these guys are and i when i say these guys i'm going to call it you know the american that will lead nato into this even more uh hardcore than what they are i don't think they're going to you know, I'm hoping that China in the next 60 days will talk some sense into both these sides here because the American economy is, you know, as as I'm going to quote uh, George Galloway, the mother of all smoke shows. I mean, that economy is up on air. It's printed money that has kept that economy going. You know, I've always said this uh, being a trader in the financial markets for almost 20 years. The S&P has no reason to be sitting up at these levels. Look at Elon Musk who bought Twitter, right? He said he paid double the amount of money for it as a private company. He said he's lost. He would he would anticipate that the company's worth half, even though he fixed it. Right. It's worth half of what he purchased it for. OK, so take that calculation to a lot of these uh, companies that are trading on the S&P index, which is the Standard & Poor's uh, top 500 companies by market cap in the U.S., you rip that out of the financial system. You have bank, uh, you know, collapsing like they are again today. America's got to, they got to go to war. They have to. I, I think they've, they've got to escalate this. And the only thing that I think is going to stop it is China comes in and says, wait a minute, like they did in the 2008 financial crisis, we're going to either A, write a check, and that check is going to be, you know, a super investment into you know, whether it's T-bills or whatever they decide to buy from the United States. But this is what I really think Brian and Danny is, is you know, really not slowing this down. They just need, it's like a printing machine that's going on. Anybody want to jump in and take that from me here? Well, I would like to bring up an image of what you're, what you're raising, Alex, brings up an image for me of what it's like for a parent, or here we could say, let's say two parents, let's say Russia and China together, okay. dealing with a, a child, dealing with a very young child, let's say the age of three or four, oftentimes at those ages, children can't really listen or hear when they are being told something they're doing is wrong. And at this moment, I can only see Right. With Russia and China and how their approach has been to U.S. escalations, U.S. led and collective West aggression towards them. I can only imagine that escalations to the level that we're speaking of, let's say full out confrontation, could only happen is if the child in the room, the United States, decides to do basically unthinkable acts, right? You call them mis mm. possible mistakes, Alex. Those mm -hmm. would only happen mm -hmm. if the United States, whether, you know, through their naval cares, through, you know, their sh sailing warships, through the Taiwan Straits all the time, if one of those times ended up being a tripwire where they go a little too far, they decide to conduct or commit some kind of act of war that really does a uh, tr trip China into needing to respond because we've had examples even in just the last two years, right? We've had Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. We've had Kevin McCarthy's meeting in California with Tsai Ing-wen. In all of those instances, China said, okay, we're going to show you what we can do. We will blockade and surround the island with military exercises and show that we can actually effectively immediately stop any kind of so-called independence movement backed by the U.S., the U.S.'s military so-called might. So, and, and the same has gone for Russia, where over and over again, this special military operation really was not seen as a full-on war. It became more than a special military operation because of NATO escalations. But Russia had been so patient for years and years and years 
basically saying we will do whatever it takes to prevent such a thing from occurring. It was when NATO decided to cross the red line, decided it wouldn't stop the onslaught of the Donbass and that it would move not only for Ukraine's accession into NATO, but also move further and further there on Russia's borders. And even talking about, as you mentioned in that question to the audience, you know, trying to seize in Russian territory like Crimea, which has been part of Russia since 2015. All of this is to say that only should the United States basically uh, cross those red lines to the point of no return. Will such a thing happen? Because we can be confident that China and Russia not only do not want any such thing, but they're not going to overreact even to a lot of these policy, we could call them errors, but a lot of these are very intentional moves by the U.S. and the collective West to provoke things. We've heard, right, and you mentioned the economic realm. It's very important because even today, right, it, it, let's take a look at Europe. Like a lot of the biggest manufacturers in Germany, Mercedes-Benz, the CEO, was on record today saying, oh, absolutely not. Any kind of war over Taiwan would, in, in decoupling with China for Germany would be a non-starter because it would destroy whatever is left of Germany's industry. The same would go worldwide, especially for the United States. Any kind of interruption in China's economic progress via a war would annihilate the U.S. economy. There would be no return. There already has been a rolling and steady economic stagnation happening in the U.S. since the 2007-2008 economic crisis. It cannot afford any kind of war with China, but that's the stakes here, right? Any kind of tripwire that is set off will immediately crash the U.S. economy. And will that lead to the kind of popular sentiment you need to wage a successful war on China if such a thing could even exist? Absolutely not. You see, Danny, I already think, in fact, I already know that the financial system here has collapsed. We are seeing window dressing happening in the banking system for staggering amounts of money. Basically, you know, the FDIC comes in and says, you know what, uh, blah, clean this mess up. Haven't you noticed that most of these banking takeovers that where the companies or the banks go to the wall happen on a Sunday? Okay, we're three for three now. Most of these companies have went to the wall, as we call it, on a Sunday. And that's because there's backdoor deals. They don't want this to hit a Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday headline where it will gain momentum. If we have an all out bank rush in the United States, you know, it's they're done. Uh, in fact, they are done. It's being backed up, propped up by a dollar that at one time had serious amount of, uh, you know, legs to it. But now it's it's you know, we're seeing companies and countries fleeing uh, the de-dollarization thing. And, and this is why I really want to go into detail about this, because. When you're done the show tonight, everybody, if you can, take some time to watch this takeover by J.P. Morgan. When you hear that name uh, in the headlines on taking over banks, it just reminds me of da Jamie Dimon, 2008, all over again. The United States banking system is on the brink of collapse. The financial markets, mm, window dressing, Fed money pumped into it. They can handle that. No problem for a while. But then again, also look at, you know, Danny, you're in New York office towers. Some of them are pretty empty. Leasings are quite empty since uh, the pandemic ended. I mean, this I'm going to steer this back to Brian. I see desperation here and I'm getting a little bit concerned that, uh, you know, what I was hoping for with China would uh, bring an end to this quickly in 60 days. If not, uh this is, are we in for eternal hellfire? I I don't I don't think so. I, like as Danny was saying, I mean Russia and China are being extremely patient because they understand that time is working in their favor. They understand that the U.S. its system is unsustainable. Their proxy war in Ukraine is unsustainable. Their attempts to promote separatism uh, on Taiwan is unsustainable. It's all entirely unsustainable. And each day that goes by, it's a, a day closer to when all of this uh, eventually has to collapse. And it's not going to collapse all at one time, but but each part will eventually ru run out of time and it'll be, it will, it will no longer be viable. 
So they're going to, both Russia and China, they are going to accept a very large amount of um, pr provocation, essentially. Just think about it. The U.S. has troops on Taiwan right now. That is a, that is a province of China, and the U.S. has troops there. They're pumping weapons into there. This is the, the ultimate provocation. If it was the other way around, it would be war already. And, and then for Russia, that they are fighting a proxy war right now against the United States and Ukraine. Uh, the U.S. proxies have been attacking deep into Russia, uh, assassinating journalists, uh, everything that you can think of to, to continuously provoke Russia. But they're they are managing it just like they did in, in Syria. There were many provocations in Syria. Russia knew that they had control of the situation and all they had to do was manage these escalations, prevent them from running out of control and sticking with their overarching plan because Russia has a sustainable plan. China has a sustainable plan. The U.S. doesn't. So it's just a matter of time of letting, you know, Danny compared to the U.S. to a, a small child <laughs> throwing a tantrum basically Eventually, they're going to run out of steam. They're going to, and it's going to be nap time. And then maybe when they wake up, they'll they'll feel a little refreshed, <laughs> ready to play a constructive role uh, here on on this planet with everybody else. So, I mean, this is the hope. The U.S. going to war. I mean, there may be temptation to do that, but the do they have the means if they go nuclear? Well, Russia has nuclear weapons. So does China. So I. I, I mean, that would be utterly insane. This is this would be go wading into territory that we've never been in before. And I, I honestly don't know what to make of it. I mean, it's a possibility, though. I mean, we have to we have to try to think about what the worst case scenario could be. That to me, that would be the worst case scenario. They're just uh, bitter, um, and and spiteful, and they just start nuking everything. That would be insane. Mm -hmm. But you never know. <laughs> Hard, hard to fathom. What you see here on the screen here, we got Silvergate, Silicon Valley Bank, First Republic Bank, and um, I'm hearing from my guys uh, in the business that there are seven more to come uh, after that. So, I mean, once we get that worked out. Uh, gentlemen, uh, I want to thank you for, guys for coming on tonight's program. Also wanted to big a uh, little bit of a shout out to the Duran, Alexander Mercuris and Alex uh, Christoforu, who has a, an outstanding channel as well. If you're not aware of them, please subscribe to them. And of course, to George Galloway's channel, where a few people on this panel, I think, uh, Brian, you were just recently on his show as well. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure if you've been on his show, but I'm sure yeah, you will be. Uh, well, there we go, Danny. <laughs> you've been on there too. So great. I haven't <laughs> yet. But anyway, um, gentlemen, it's been outstanding. I know, um, Brian, you're under the weather, so we won't take too much of your time today. No, that's uh, okay. And and uh, I'm going to hand it over to Brian to say the last remarks and what you think might come up here geopolitically wise in the last week. Then over to Danny and I'll shut down the show for everybody. OK, back to you, Brian. Uh, I, I think we just have to I think we have to be patient. I think we have to temper our expectations. We all want to see uh, these conflicts. And uh, when you've experienced conflict, when you've seen people that, you know, in places that, you know, uh, ravaged by conflict, even, uh, you know, a, say here in Bangkok in 2010 is uh, just mm. a, a tiny fraction of what Ukraine or say Syria are going through or what Taiwan could potentially go through. You you understand that it's it's not something you're just seeing on the TV. It's real. It's real people's lives. You want to see these people return to a normal life. Uh, but it, it, it is a process. The U.S. and what it has created on Earth was not created overnight. It's been created over many, many years of many different people contributing to it, uh, building it up and using it, exploiting it to create the harm that we have seen uh, all throughout these years. It's going to take an equal amount of investment for many people to first slow this down and stop it and then begin undoing all the damage that's been done. We have to keep that in mind. It's not going to be one person or one election or one negotiation that ends this. It's going to be a very long incremental process ac across many different uh, areas of focus, economics, military, everything. Uh, so we have to understand that. We have to understand our own role in all of this. Uh, one person cannot change everything, but we can do our contribution, it all eventually is going to add up. People say in the alternative media, trying to get the word out there, challenging the central narrative put out there by uh, the US, uh, Europe, uh, the UK, 
Uh, so we we have to do that. We we can support independent media. We can look at giant corporations that are part of U.S. hegemony and see how we can divert our money away from them and either locally or to smaller companies that are are less toxic and less involved in it. And people are doing this. That's what multipolarism is, and it is making a difference. So we just have to continue doing it. Uh, be patient. Uh, Alex, I want to thank you for inviting me on. It's always a, a pleasure to share the screen with Danny. Uh, you mentioned the Durand and George Galloway, both both excellent uh, platforms. I highly recommend them. Uh, I, I I cite the Durand almost daily. Uh, so again, thank thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Brian. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time here today. And over to you, Danny. And just wanted to say uh, Cyrus will be back in a couple of weeks to be on the show here as well. Uh, Danny, now is your time. <laughs> thank you. Yes. And, and thanks, uh, Alex, so much for making this happen. Of course, I always enjoy sharing time with uh, Brian. Uh, you know, there's uh, everyone that you mentioned as well, you know, top, just top notch geopolitical analysts and just analysts of this changing world order. You know, I, I do want to just add, lastly, I think that one of the real interesting things that we need to pay attention to as these conflicts develop is the fact that while the United States has no capabilities to both wage the, this these really dangerous wars with russia and china the most dangerous perhaps that they've ever engaged in while also maintaining economic stability the same does not go for russia and china russia has taught us in the last year plus that it can both stabilize its economy move on the path of de-dollarization become really the leader of that trend the leader of that initiative as well as fight back against sanctions right the thousands of sanctions that exist on it at this moment the hundreds of billions of assets that were stolen from it by the collective west as well as the military side of this where nato has pumped ukraine to the tune of multiple militaries and has attempted to defeat russia's armed forces all of that has happened at the same time in china of course everyone i think is aware here that China's economy has only progressed over the last several years and in the first quarter of 2023 grew at a pace that was higher than the estimate at 4.5%. So China is able to build up its defenses, prepare for any kind of provocations. It is ready to uh, uh, you know, meet a confrontation around so-called Taiwan independence if one should occur while also being able to meet key economic objectives, both domestically and politically. I mean, internationally, it is the leader of BRICS. It is the uh, foremost provider of infrastructure, development, innovation around the world, poverty alleviation. We can go on and on and on. And so China is both capable of doing that and defending itself, while the United States does not have that capability. So that should give us hope that whatever absolutely dangerous provocation and escalations the united states may want to or may even pursue we, we should know that there is a stable force in the world led by these two countries and all of the countries a lot of them uh, that are aligning with them that will provide a more rational alternative and that should give us hope and so thank you so much you know please do support my work if you can subscribe to my channel there are many ways to support me as I try to make upgrades in the cost. Of, I, I kind of envy you two living out in Asia because the uh, cost of living crisis is very high. You know, all of the things you talked about, Alex, with the banks being gobbled up and eating themselves alive and being propped up. All of that is huge effects on the cost of living in a place like the United States where inflation has been the worst. And so, you know, please do support all of our work, independent media is certainly needed. And you can definitely do that by heading over to my channel um, at Danny Haifong.